Hello everybody and welcome to Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. I'm Jack and today I'm here with Joe for the last top 10 of this season. Today we're looking at the uh, Omnipoke top 10 picks for the World Championships. Nashville is two weeks away. Um, so yeah, it's it's time to really start working out what is the play, what's going to win this world. Uh, and we've got we've summarised all of our thoughts uh, and decided to get them all into the top 10 as usual. So Joe, if you want to kick things off. Sure. We'll be starting off with one of the decks that's gained a new breath of life thanks to the Celestial Storm set. It's going to be spread variants trying to take advantage of the new Shrine of Punishment Stadium, which is absolutely insane. It puts one damage counter on all GX Pokemon in between turns. So getting these extra ticks along the way is going to be really good for adding up a total amount of damage counters on the opponent's side of the field for plays with Tapu Lele or with Espeon EX as well as just giving you more counters to play with in general for getting one hit knockout or getting knockouts over time. So there's a couple of different schools of thought here. We're talking about Yveltal break variants, which we saw at the NAIC. Um, it came ninth, Yveltal, with Hooper. And the break itself gains so much momentum from Shrine of Punishment because the break does 120 to the active and 30 to every one of your opponent's bench that already has damage counters on it. So the Shrine is just a natural partner there. And then we're looking at Tapu Poco, Garbodor, or just spread in general uh, with like counter energies and Lele and stuff like that to maneuver all these damage counters around. So a couple of schools of thought with the decks overall, but the goal is the same. It's going to be using Shrine, spread a bunch of damage counters. And this, this strategy is going to be very, very good against Zoro Rock because they typically play one Acerola and no other healing cards. They're very vulnerable to uh, the spread and they're very vulnerable to being devolved which is very strong uh the veltal as well annoying hit points for them with that fighting resist they oftentimes need like kakui in combination with a lot of other things so that can be very awkward for them and also the necrozma variants the malamar decks they're all go going to struggle because again spread can really um put a lot of pressure on them the garbador of course can put pressure on if you're playing that build really slow them down get a lot of damage counters on that board and you can again go for an easy devolve for multiple Malamars being picked up, or you can go for, um, again, that Lele. You're playing Psychic stuff already. Sometimes you're playing Latios, which is going to be really good for you for dealing with Inkays and stuff like that. So I think you just have a lot of good answers against these couple of decks. I think your worst couple of matchups is going to be the Zoro Lock deck because they're playing two parallel, one Ace Roller, two Max Potion, pretty much guaranteed. That's a lot of healing of all the spread you're going to do. Um, and that's really awkward for you. I think that's going to be a problem overall because they can reuse them with puzzles and they will um additionally another bad matchup is going to be the new stack attacker gx denying uh minus 10 damage to all your ultra beast pokemon that's active and bench so really your only damage is coming from the stadium at that point because with two stackers on the board your coco's doing nothing they can even be playing three and it can negate the spread damage from the Yveltal break so it's going to be really rough for you. Um, I think these are the hardest matchups to try and conquer if you're going to try playing out this really awesome new stadium card. Yeah, definitely. I think this stadium card has received uh, a lot of hype. Another obviously awkward thing is Mr. Mime is always a pretty splashable tech card. That may make you, make you want to go down a spread garb route. I've seen some people tinkering with that as well. So that could be another way um, the, the deck is played. In general, like the spread deck has so many avenues just opened up by this. Uh, stadium there's lots of different ways to play it you've just got to work out uh, what can handle um, as many of these matchups as possible and Heart Hammer is a big one for helping some of these more awkward matchups uh, and Heart Hammer is such a strong card right now the um, the format is so sort of special energy reliant there's so much Zoro about which you'll see throughout this video uh, it's just really really important in general to have um, to be able to hate on them so it's always good to try and find space for one or two I think in your list um, the obviously big thing is you are pretty special reliant uh, yourself if you're not playing the Yveltal uh, side of things a lot of the time you're going to be playing counters plus DCEs so you've got to be aware of that as well but in general I think Spread received one of the best new tools and seems to be in a better place than ever um, we j there's so many avenues that we couldn't pick one so we just lumped it all together um, and we're sure I think we're pretty certain to see at least some people playing this considering it was being played like you say at the NAIC and it didn't even have Shrine then, so the, it looks like this is going to make somewhat of a splash at Worlds. Next up we have Malamar, the first of the uh, Forbidden Light sort of rock, paper, scissors type decks. Unfortunately Malamar has really suffered um, from this set. It's still 
a relatively decent archetype, but Zoro, Zoro has gained so much uh, sort of momentum. That's really what started to pull it, started to pull it down. Buzzrock is still a fantastic matchup and is still one of the top decks out there right now. So you're going to be going into this tournament with a good Buzzrock, which is never a bad thing at all. Uh, I think Buzzrock is still definitely one of the decks to beat. So that's always going to be fantastic. And obviously Greninja, um, if you're running, which you should be, running the uh, Giratina promo is pretty much a free matchup for you as well. And there is a lot of ninja talk right now. Uh, Non-EX attackers are really rife in this Zoro heavy meta, uh, especially when they can also ability lock. So I think having a good good ninja is just going to uh, inc increase your quality of life throughout the day, even if it's not going to be a matchup you see multiple times. If you can beat that damn ninja you're going to play against, or you're sure to play against at least once during the day, you'll probably feel a little bit better about yourself, even if um, it, it's just one round. So you know they're both they're both very important matchups to matchups to hit. Of course, Zoro decks are the big downside. Zoro Garb um, has kind of exploded onto the scene uh, after the NAIC. It's still uh, it was seeing tink a lot of people were tinkering, tinkering with it before, uh, but now I think it's debated as to one of the best Zoro variants and one of probably the best Garb variant right now. Um, and obviously the deck is so ability reliant, it's really important to um, have both of these tools against Malamar, and it just does it so well. So Zoro, the Zoro Garb is going to be always going to be a pretty bad matchup. And similarly, Zoro Rock, you've got the Zoros for the Dawn Wings. Um, and the rock pretty much sweeps up the rest of the attackers through Dangerous Rogue, uh, plus being a really, really big attacker, um, really, really big HP, meaning that Necrozma, the regular Necrozma, the Black Rain Necrozma, has to attach extra energy if you're not playing things like Fury Belt uh, to one-shot the Lycan Rock, which can, even in sort of an ability, uh, in a an energy acceleration style deck like this one, can still be an issue. So, you know, it's always going to be difficult against the Zoro decks, which is why, unfortunately, Malamar has dropped all the way down to ninth. Just because Zoro seems to be so rife in this meta, it's not the ideal meta for it. Yeah, that's definitely the case, I feel. I feel if you're playing the Malamar, you're almost over-predicting, hoping more people bring Buzz because they're expecting Zoroark, but so risky because there's definitely going to be Zoroark. There's so many iterations of it, it's just going to show up. I think the three blur really helps, obviously against the Garbodor, but even just getting rid of parallels, not only does it hurt your board physically to be on the board, but... Delinquent also really, really hurts Malamar decks. They don't have a natural draw engine other than sometimes a Rangaroo. So getting delinquented is so painful for you. It is basically game losing. You need to top deck your way out of that. Otherwise, you've lost. And more Zoroark decks are going towards that. So having blowers to hand just to get rid of stadiums every turn is going to be really important for you, even if you're not dealing with Garbodor. So that's got to be the tech choice for me. Next up, we're going to be talking about another new deck from Celestial Storm, and this time it's going to be the poster boy Rayquaza GX. A little bit low down on this list. Um, I think a lot of people are in debate around Rayquaza. It's going to be one of these decks where you've got to be pretty brave to bring it because it's a new deck. You've got to have enough testing with it to make sure that you're happy with the 60 cards and that it's got good matchups against the things you're expecting. At the moment, I think it's nailed on matchups are going to be things like um, Zoropod, where you can just ramp quite nicely and they're so uh rigid with their two hit ko approach that you can get around that quite nicely um i think also the malamar variants you're slightly favored against because they're going to give you the luxury of time to use things like your prism star to um, get a bunch of energies on board because then the requires can sweep turn after turn no matter what they're trying to do in response so i think those are your favorable matchups if you're looking at requaza i think the unfavorables include zoro garb uh, because not only can they ability lock, but it's more looking at the trash launch here because Rayquaza has got to go fast. It mills itself. You can't control how many items you put into the discard pile at times because you are playing acro bikes and Rayquaza himself discards so much that you just naturally play into trash launch, even if you're playing conservatively, like in your own hand by like turn two or three. It just it's just happening that trash launch is going to get you. So that's a real problem for the Ray. I also think that. Um, the Zoro Rock and a few other Zoro variants are a bit more awkward because they have one hit code potential that Zoropod doesn't have. And that's, again, going to be a real struggle for you because as soon as Ray start hitting the discard pile, your deck gets way, way worse. So definitely got to watch out for those decks. I think, again, there's a couple of schools of thought for Ray. People are trying it with Garbodor to improve your Zoro matchups across the board. And some people are trying to go straight. I think the tech of our choice is going to be the red card for either the straight builds or the guard builds because... Just getting this down and trying to disrupt the early game as you're motoring through 
again, it can be just like what we said with the Malamar. It gives you an extra turn, and that extra turn gets you more energies on the board, which is great for stabilization. So this red card can buy you a turn, and that can buy Rayquaza a game, basically. So that's why we're choosing this card. Even if it's just a two count, because you motor through the deck, you will get value from it, in my opinion. So that's our choice there. Yeah, definitely. It can just slow people down, which is essentially uh, what Ray wants. It wants to try and steal the game before people can really get set up. Uh, it's a really, really interesting deck. It's a deck that I think both me and Joe learnt a lot from playing the deck. You you, you think about the deck very differently before you've played it as, as compared to after you play it. So it's definitely one, even if you're not considering, just a tryout, just to know what, what your Ray opponents are going to be doing, because... Uh, it may not play out the w the way you would naturally think. It's worth at least having an idea of how uh, a su the, like the successful line of players that Ray makes um, it sort of happens. So yeah, it's a really really interesting deck. Like you say, it is slightly low, maybe a little bit controversial, uh, but we think there are better be better decks out there right now. One of those is indeed Zoro Pod. Zoro Pod has been around since November and is still on our top ten. I don't think it's made. I don't think we've made a top ten since where it hasn't been. Um, on the top 10, so it's still a fantastic deck. It's just sort of a testament to how strong Zoro is in general. Um, but right now, Pod is pretty much still one of its best partners. It's the super consistent 50 50 style version of it where you're going to be doing as much as you can um, with as little sort of risk versus reward. You're going to always be doing exactly what you want. Uh, there's sort of less frills that you can, you can do. The 60, I think, is pretty set. There's maybe one or two cards you can tinker around with. But in general, I think we all know what Zoro Pod does. Zoro Garb is a pretty good matchup. You're not too, too bothered about the um, Garbodors if you're able to find your Field Blowers somewhat efficiently. Um, you can always trade on their Garbs with the Glissopods anyway. And you like Zoro has an inherent... The, the way Zoro draws, you don't need to be discarding items. So Trash and Arch doesn't ever need to be an issue for you if you don't want it to be. Especially with the res Resistance as well. Similarly with Stack Attacker, uh, you're able to armor press out of Dusk Main range, which is one big thing. The Beast Box style decks like to try and close out the game, especially against Zoro decks, uh, by setting up some Beast Rings with some Dusk Main Necrozmas, um, and you're able to out sort of you're, you're able to outlive their uh, one sort of big swing. And if you're able to, um, the deck wants to one shot against you, and if it can't, it really really starts to struggle in the late game. Uh, the sort of resistance from stack attacker whilst it is annoying it's not like the end of the world the stackers themselves have 180 so you can actually still two shot them pretty much always which is one big thing so there's kind of always targets on your their side of the board no matter what board state they have so it's definitely one of the nicer matchups again the ganadel uh, is resisted by zoroark as well so their main attacker in the early game is resisted by one of your main attackers which is decent of course uh, zoro lock is a bit of an issue uh, Zoroark was kind of built to be the Zoroark deck that beats Zoroark decks. You're uh, full of things like healing cards, Ace Rollers, Max Potions, plus they're often full of uh, cards that are going to be disrupting your energy as well. And we all know that Zoroark Galissapod does not like its energy uh, being disrupted. It only has seven, so in general, that's not really what it wants to see. So it can be a bit of an issue. Um, Zoroark, Zoro, uh, Zoro Lock, sorry, is the is the Zoro deck designed to beat Zoro all of the other Zoro decks, so it makes sense that it's a bad matchup. Similarly, uh, Buzzrock has so much hyper-aggression, you really need to, um, I think, get pretty lucky to be able to guarantee a secure victory against Zoro Lock, uh, against Buzzrock, sorry. The Lycanrocks being weak to Galispod is always a nice thing, but the fact that Baby Buzzers trade so efficiently in the early game and can force you to take go down to four prizes, which means uh, one Baby Buzz will be taking two prizes with one energy, uh, and then you, you're let into B-string range as well. There's a lot of awkward hurdles that you have to face as the Zoropod player. It's definitely winnable, but it's not a fun ride at all. I think the tech we've gone for is the Link one. Uh, like I say, there's probably 58, 59 cards that are pretty set in Zoropod right now. Uh, but in general, just having that delinquent we've seen uh, over the past few tournaments, beginning with Sheffield Regionals and since then NAIC uh, and Valencia, a lot of people are starting to tinker around with Delinquent and it seems to be a really really strong inclusion. Just being able to completely negate the game from someone, uh, especially if they're not playing around it in game one. In a game one scenario this card is so strong, it's such uh, sort of sort of a tempo swing, it's, it's crazy how strong it is. Also works for discarding things like parallels and stuff, uh, which is another nice sort of niche use. You'd still have your own parallels to get down first. 
and field blowers, but in general, it's another nice feature of the card as well. So yeah, Zoropod's still up there. Uh, there are Zoro decks that are better right now, we believe, but in general, it's the sort of safe Zoro deck. It's it's its list has been pretty similar for the past uh, few months, and you know you you know what you're getting with this deck. Yeah, you're right. It seems to be still the relative 50-50 deck. I still think it's got one of the cleaner Buzzwell matchups of the Zoro builds. Um, but I think the Achilles heel is just the fact that Zoro Lock is going to have a natural advantage. They just have that little bit more hate in their deck than you do, be it with handiworks or an extra e-hammer or just these small advantages they'll gain against you. It's just going to be a little bit too much for it to handle, and that's probably why it's you've seen it slip a little bit despite being such a strong performer throughout the season. Next up, we'll see some Greninja. Uh, me and Jack actually both played this uh, in a League Cup just after the Valencia Special, and that was basically because we looked at the meta day one in the special event itself, and we were like, you know what? Everyone's playing Zoroark here. Why don't we just play Frogs? And that's pretty much the mentality of the Greninja player right now and why you should potentially think about playing this deck. Um, as people move away from Zoro Pod into things like Zoro Lock and even Zoro Rock. These are much, much nicer matchups for you. They're more heavily punished by enhanced hammers and your Greninjas just live more, which is great for you, obviously. So um, as we see a shift away from Zoro Pod, Greninja loves seeing that and it could be a small indication of a rise in that deck, especially in day one, because that field is going to be difficult no matter what. But if you can have a very nice Zoroark, probably the best Zoroark matchup, really. It's going to be really beneficial for you. Also, Stack Attack and Aganadel, probably going to be a reasonable matchup for you. They find it hard to continue, uh, continually one-shot all your Greninjas, just being one prizes, whereas Stack and Naga really does try and use things like GX attacks to take two prize turns and stuff like that. So that's also going to be beneficial for you. Some of the more awkward ones, obviously the Malamar, very bad matchup. Um, the Giratina just says no. But again, talking about meta, Greninja's in a great meta right now. Malamar's on the decline. Galissapod's on the decline. This is exactly what you want to see if you're a Greninja player. So if you're playing Frogs, you only lose to yourself, which has always been the case. So even if you're, like, in theory, like, 100% against the Zoroark decks, you're only really, like, 60% because you lose to yourself X amount of times. Another thing I want to mention, just for Worlds exactly, is that ties are horrible for you. And Greninja can tie a good amount of times because it wins slow and it loses fast. So that's what you, you need to bear in mind. You can dominate someone in a game one, then just get donked, and then a tie is as bad as a loss. So there are reasons not to play Greninja. It's likely going to be nine rounds at Worlds. You've got to not brick a lot of the time. So you're always trying to roll high when you play the deck. But matchup-wise... It sounds like a very strong play. Our tech of choice is going to be what we actually played uh, in this League Cup, and that's Bursting Balloons uh, over Choice Bands. The Bursting Balloons gives you a lot of help against Buzz Rock, which is otherwise a slight unfavored. I think with a high count of E-Hammer and Bursting Balloon puts that way back in your favor because you can really punish them early game for taking early prizes on Frogs. Uh, which puts some great damage counts on the board, most notably for the baby Buzzwalls, because otherwise they can just get carried away without any sort of um, retribution, really. They can just stack three energy onto their first baby Buzzwall. That goes down, then they can just start doing like sledgehammer turns and stuff like that. It just gets out of control too easily. So the Bursting Balloon putting some counts on the board is a really nice check to that. Yeah, definitely. So I think... I, I pretty much back everything that Joe said there. If you, the meta looks really good for Greninja, but we can't rate it any higher than around here because it is such a such an inconsistent deck. It feels like so you know, take uh, take the placement with a pinch of salt. If you uh, want to have one last ride, this is actually the only deck on the uh, in the, it, within the top ten that fully rotates. So one last ride, maybe it's time. Maybe Greninja can finally uh, not not get second this time and win worlds we'll have to wait and see but it does seem like this is one of the better years for it to do it so uh, we'll see we'll see what happens next up we have beast box obviously stack attacker was the big big buff from this set for the deck that uh, ability is so strong just pretty much giving all of your uh, all of your pokemon a resistance of 10 20 30 no matter what it is it's really gonna matter sort of it's similar to how shrine um builds up damage over time it's similar that the more the longer the game is, the more value this ability is going to get. So the more stack attackers and the longer the game goes, 
the more value you're going to be getting and the more stack attacks you're out, the longer the game will be. So it works really, really well. It was a fantastic buff for the deck. Uh, some good matchups. Obviously, your main attacker, Nag uh, Naganadel, is a one energy, two prize. It is two prizes, but it's a one energy attacker that is one shotting uh, baby buzzes and buzzwall GXs pretty easily. Uh, Lycan Rocks can be a bit of an issue, but you do have ways of knocking them out within the deck. As I've mentioned, Duskwain is often a very good inclusion and pretty cleanly wipes out a Lycan Rock, uh, leaving, your, leaving yourself with a 190 HP Pokemon in the active, uh, which can be difficult for a baby buzz to deal with, especially if they're not on a four prize turn. Um, because they're going to have to start flipping some coins, which is kind of what the position you want to put them in. Obviously, spread is another good, well, yeah, another really good matchup. Other than the punish, uh, other than the shrine of punishment, they're not really able to do any damage to you. Um, and in general, they can't use their devolve strategies on anything other than the um, Naganadels. And if you really don't want to, you don't have to get Naganadels out. You can just pretty much have a board of three or four stack attackers, and you will just win that game because all they will be able to do is put four counters on you in between turns. You're going to be running your ultra spaces anyway. You're going to be running field blowers, so there's they're not going to be able to get many damage counters on you at all, uh, especially by the time you've been able to just take six prizes on things like Tapu Kokos, Latioses, that kind of thing. So as we mentioned when talking about spread, Beast Box is a pretty awkward matchup for it. Uh, so you're pretty much happy to see any uh, Shrine of Punishment style decks going into this. Obviously, we mentioned when talking about Zoropod, it can be a bit of an issue. Uh, the Galissapods being able to armor press out of your Dusk main range. Like I say, often the way the deck wins is being able to set up Dusk mains for the late game. Uh, the, you do have Stack Attack's GX Attack, which is a fantastic GX Attack, uh, but you actually need them to have taken four. Pro you need to have taken four prizes already to be able to one shot a Galissapod after it's armor pressed anyway. So it can still be pretty awkward. Um, if you can get around the Galissapod, maybe take it out early. It can be a fine matchup. But if they're uh, a smart Zoropod player that just sort of sets up Galissapods that are just going to be armor pressing pretty much the whole time. Uh, that can be a pretty big issue for you. Obviously, Greninja is a bit of an awkward matchup for you as well. Uh, you don't really have a fantastic way of being able to uh, one-shot Greninjas once they've evolved uh, into their sort of the regular Greninja form, and then when they're the break, it's even more difficult. And your pretty, your whole deck is pretty much two prize Pokemon, so in general, they're going to be trading up if they get into the game. Uh, so you really want to avoid them getting into the game. Just because that's that's pretty much one of your only win conditions, just going sort of aggro in a Ganadel, trying to take out as many prizes as you can and hoping they have some of the classic Greninja bricking issues. Uh, the deck is obviously such a tanky deck with stack attackers right now. We've decided to go for a tech of Max Potion. Uh, it can really, really help, really surprise people, uh, especially if they're so, sort of starting to set up two shots rather than trying to take one shots. Um, as, they're being, as they're playing around stack attacker, they're like, oh, well, I can't. I don't have the damage in my deck to be able to one-shot this Naganadel anymore, so maybe I'm going to have to two, maybe even three-shot it. Uh, if you're able to spring a, su a surprise Max Potion or two on them, it can really sort of throw their numbers off, especially with uh, Stack Attacker and Naganadel both doing sort of a solid 120, 150, up to 150 damage. Uh, you can really, really swing sort of the, the trades back in your favour, especially with Naganadel also being a one, pri one energy attacker as well. It's a really, really nice tech to have. And one I don't think many people will be expecting. Yeah, Beast Box is really cool. Um, I think it takes the mantle of Malamar as that card that goes in the triangle for <laughs> having a good Boswell and having a slightly weak Zoroark. But I think it's way less so the case than Malamar, which is very important to know. Much less weak to Garbodor than Malamar is, which is really important because of Zorogarb. Uh, and much, uh, well, definitely slightly better against the Zoroark decks than the Malamar is. Um, as we mentioned, Jack talked mainly about the Naganadel, so I guess I'll talk about the sort of turbo metal style deck where you're playing more heavy Dusk main. You're playing things like sometimes Celesteela GX stackers themselves. Um, I would advise playing Delmise in that build so you can hit 130 with your stackers, which is a big deal, or you can play Fury Belts, your choice. Um, but the uh, Delmise is just one space in the deck, which is very good for you. Um, and I think that's got some potential behind it as well. Um, I think stack attackers are nice sort of two-hit KO style attacker, which is just frequently churning out that 130, which was something that was very, very much lacking in the Turbo Metal deck, where it was just all in on the Solgalay and Prism Star, trying to set up three Dust Main big knockouts. Now you have this stability in there, both with hit points and with an attack, which is great for you. Um, and at the same time, it gets a new GX attack, which is great. Um, and the other point is that we get Acrobike, which is another big tool for the Turbo Metal build, because you have more ways of getting energy in your discard pile, 
and less clunk factor. So I actually think Turbo Nettles, thanks to Stack Attacker, gains a lot as well. So I wanted to wrap that in there with Beast Box because I think it's definitely one worth talking about. Next up, we have Zoroark, Lycanroc, uh, the old faithful once again coming back. Pretty high on this list, fourth place right now. Uh, we think it's naturally got that good Malamar, which we've already discussed. Also, fairly reasonable against most Zoroark variants. I think Zoropod, most people say it's 50 50. Zorolock, again, fairly 50 50 ish. Your hope really is that your Lycanroc deals with their Zoroark so they can't draw into all their hammers and disruption cards that they have. Um, I think it's a reasonable matchup. I think you have a quite strong Zoro Garb, so that's a good driving force for Zoroark Lycanroc, in my opinion. I think um, also just the inherent power level of the deck. Lycanroc, as we know, we've seen with Boswell and we've seen with this deck already how just potent the card is in the meta right now. Having that free gust turn, letting you use other supporters at the same time, just so, so powerful. And the fact that it can blow up pretty much anything in front of you gives you an option against most decks. So again, this fits the role of sort of like 50-50 or better deck overall. I think the hardest matchups are going to be the Bosrock. Um, you don't really have space for like um, things like Team Flare Grunt, which other builds are trying to use. You're just sort of hoping that you can kill their Lycanroc before they kill yours. Um, and that's, you know, never really a tried and trusted strategy. You're still worried about the baby Buzzwall. I think now that they have Regirock as well, uh, the new Regirock from Celestial Storm, it gets even harder because they can carry Zoroark's even easier than they used to be able to. So that's something to be aware of. Not the greatest matchup for you. Angry Ninja is much worse because you are more reliant on a two energy attacking Lycanroc that, again, can't one hit KO breaks other than the first one that you can GX. So that's something to bear in mind. For tech cards, I think just focusing on the strengths of this deck is better than trying to patch up the weaknesses. And the Baby Buzzwell is a great way to make that Zoroark, again, more of a lockdown. Having a Sledgehammer turn, it's very difficult uh, to play around. And it'll just, you know, when people are sucking up these Rock Ruffs and the Zeruas, they feel like they're safe. Uh, but then you can just bring out the Sledgehammer turn and it can completely rock them because even if they have to respond with a Mew, that's amazing for you because you're a Zoroark deck still, so you can just mop up another two prize cards. It's going to be a really nice one-up, I think, for this deck. Yeah, definitely. I think there's uh, a, a nice a nice sort of fit for a one-prize attacker in this deck. It seems to fit the best. And Buzzwall, obviously, you've, uh, you've got fighting energy anyway, so it just seems like a natural fit. This is my personal Zor favourite Zoroark deck right now. Um, this is the one I've done the most testing with, and I really think, like you say, the inherent power of Lycanroc is just so, so strong right now. So it's definitely uh, good to try and abuse this card and get the most value of it, and I think it's in a really, really good spot right now. However, another Zoro deck that is doing well is, of course, Zoro Garb. We saw it win NAIC, then win v the Valencia Special the week later, both by Stefan Ivanov. Um, so his list is pretty clean. I think he played 59 cards the same throughout those two tournaments so uh, there's lists out there that you can look at that have seen very very high success which is really really good obviously malamar variants are one of the most free matchups you've got you've got zoroark for uh, the dawn wings plus in general you've got uh, garb to stop their abilities and once they start field blurring and getting their abilities back online you have trash alliance to trade up in the late game it's just such a free matchup it's insane there's so many good good things for you and then as we mentioned there's also the rayquaza matchup Obviously, you have Ability Lock, which is less consequential than actual Trash Alliance itself uh, in the late game. Again, Ray does not like to be traded up against, and that's essentially the best thing that uh, Trash Alliance does. So yeah, you're going to have a really, really good time against these people trying out some of the more niche decks. However, some of your Zoroark matchups do suffer because of that. I think in general, you have a little bit less of a consistent Zoroark deck. Um, Zoropod and Zoro Rock seem to be a bit more consistent. And be a bit more hard hitting in the early turns, especially if they have thought about the Zoro Guard matchup and maybe up their blower count to three. I know there was a lot of triple blower Zoro pods uh, in its early days. It's kind of dropped down to two, but I can definitely see it going back up to three, especially with Zoro Garb success lately. Um, and in general, maybe Lycanroc doesn't do that, but it is the more aggressive deck out of the two and maybe just races you out of the game anyway. So in general, it can be a bit awkward playing against some of these other. Zoro matchups, even though you are an ability lock deck, because at the same time, uh, Zoro Garb has seen so much success. There are going to be, it is going to be on people's radar. It definitely is on people's radar. And I think, even though it's not our number one pick, I think is possibly one of the decks, if not the deck to beat right now, uh, just because of how well it's done in the past few months. 
Our tech choice is a game delinquent. We've mentioned how good this card is, so I'm not going to bleat on about it too much, but it's another really, really strong card, especially in this deck. If we're able to uh, Garbatoxin lock them out of the game as with a delinquent, they have so many less draw outs. Uh, they pretty much have to have a card in hand plus draw a field blower or draw uh, pretty much top deck a support of a turn. So, you know, there's so many more uh, awkward scenarios when you have ability lock plus delinquent. It's even stronger in this deck than it is in pod. Yeah, I agree. Zorgarb, very, very potent deck right now. I think it's one of the most punishing decks if it goes first in a Zorgarb mirror match because you can just completely stop the game from like turn two if your tool sticks on Garbodor. They can just not play around that at times. And that's a really good thing to have, really. Forget all that big brain 50 minute one game thing just win on turn two because you put a garbador into play and just hit them for 120 and they just can't respond so that's really good i think going second it's actually one of the worst zorok decks in a mirror match which is super weird so um i'm also slightly concerned by zoro control having just more energy denial because zorok are very reliant on uh unit energies and just those dcs and if you're locking yourself out of the game uh that energy hate is going to be way scarier for you so that's something to bear in mind um, it's definitely a concern that more people are going to be playing things like field blowers and enhanced hammers just because of the natural tend towards Zoroark. So I think Zoroark may have been a better deck for the NEIC meta than it will be for Worlds. That's kind of why we don't have it top, but I think it's going to be one of the most popular decks and there will be a lot of people doing well with it because Garb is just so oppressive and combined with a pretty good card as well. Yeah. From there, we have Buzzrock. Um, Definitely a strong contender throughout the entire season. Still one of the most powerful, aggressive decks we have in the format. Still pretty reasonable reasonable against most Zoroark. Um, I think pretty much everyone says that Buzzworld is at least 50-50 against the Zoro decks. Even things like Zoro Control, which is playing weakness policy and playing um, energy denial. I think it's still a 50-50 matchup. Again, I'll uh, talk about Celestial Storm's new cards. Uh, you gain this Regirock card, which is kind of being slept on at the moment i think because it only has 120 hit points people are debating whether or not it's actually worth it but the fact that you can ko zoroarks for one attachment with a strong energy and choice band and diancy in play is just really filthy so that's something to be aware of i think it's a nice like at lowest a, a new one off for buzz rock but it could be that you're even shifting the baby buzz and reggie rock counts and playing like three reggie rock for the early turn aggression and then like one or two baby buzz just to have the sledgehammer turn um, I think that's actually really reasonable because making all your strong energies basically live as if they were beast energy turns. Like, the scariest thing as a Zoroark player before this Regirock came out was that turn where they can get a knockout with a baby buzz with that one beast energy attachment and choice band. Well, if you're playing Regirock, all four strong energies are now that out. So it's really, really scary and dangerous for the, for the Zoroark players. And that's a big driving force for buzz. Uh, rock. Uh, you've also got a pretty good Rayquaza. These baby buzzes just put in so much work. They can be two-shotting uh, quite quickly while they're trying to set up board. Um, and you have your Sledgehammer turn, which can sometimes, again, take a knockout. If not, you're doing a huge chunk, forcing Guzmas from them every turn, when, again, they don't have a natural big draw engine outside of things like Arangru and Acrobikes as well. So you can force many non-GXs in their face, and that's something that Rayquaza really doesn't want to see happen. Your bad matchups, you're not happy to see the Malamar. Again, it's not worse than like 40%, I would say, but you're still never happy to see the uh, purple stuff overall. But that's going down in play. The big new headache from Celestial Storm, I guess, is the Naganadal Stacker Stacker stuff. Even um, Stacker Stealer, because it has... Uh, Stella Stealer has resistance, and you have the Stack Attackers, which do additional reductions of damage. It's going to be really annoying for you, so... Uh, these are the things you want to try and avoid, but Buzzrock could be a very good pick. I think Field Blow is sort of sneaking into lists as like a one-of right now to try and just wipe out the uh, weakness policies that we've seen incorporated into some Zoro builds. So that's an interesting avenue. One more note I want to make on Buzzrock is that the engine could be changing. Um, I've seen murmurs of a Mag Cargo Oranguru list for your new draw engine instead of Octillery. And I've seen some top players piloting it and saying it's very potent. So that's something to keep an eye on because guaranteeing things on certain terms just wins games, most notably things like B-String. How many games are won and lost by the amount of B-Strings a Buzzworld player hits? 
well, the fact that you can guarantee it with a mag cargo turn, combining it with Scorched Earth, or combining it with a Ranguru, these are all very good things. So that's something to bear in mind. Try out the new engine as well, because I think it could be potent. Definitely. I think I don't think Buzzwall's being slept on, but I think a couple of people have kind of put it on the back burner because there's so many Zoroark decks that seem viable right now, and then Ray is the big new turbo deck. People kind of it feels like not many people are playing this right now, which is really, really weird considering it was like head and shoulders one of the best decks of the last format. So don't forget about this guy. Uh, I think the Magcargo Oranguru engine is really spicy. Um, if it if it works, obviously you've got the you've got pros and cons to both. But as Joe mentioned, Beastring is such a swing card where you just win win games if you hit it some of the time. So you know it's definitely worth trying. Uh, it's 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 weird to see it second considering it was so in my opinion head and shoulders one of the best decks last format. Uh, or last season, yeah, no, last format, I guess it is, um, pre-Celestial Storm. Uh, but yeah, it's still definitely up there. It was our number two pick. Falling short only to Zoro Lock, which has sort of appeared out of nowhere. It was the big surprise deck of NAIC. Um, the Zoro deck to beat all Zoro decks, it was kind of dubbed because you have so many different answers. Uh, Zoro decks in general are such a good matchup. You have just so many different things you can do there's so many avenues of play um you've got sort of healing you've got milling you've got just in general you've got weakness policies you've got loads of different things you can play um and it's just really really strong it's one of the decks that i think as a as a collective sort of community still hasn't even been figured out yet hasn't been refined hasn't been solved there's so many different lists we're seeing uh, pretty much every day so it's definitely a deck to watch even if you don't perhaps feel confident to play it for the tournament it will be the deck to watch i think going into this tournament because almost every single different player playing this list will be playing something different in it it's just there's just so much versatility to it so it's definitely going to be a really really interesting deck to see obviously you've got pretty good matchups against the malamar stuff as always as a zoroark deck and in general most zoroark decks are favored for you with all of your uh, healing and energy denial that kind of thing zoro garb causes a few more headaches we saw in the final of NAIC the kind of kind of the way that matchup goes uh, i think it's definitely winnable for zorak zoro lock but in general we we've seen it happen um stefan ivanov was able to take down this deck after not too much preparation that i don't think many people knew about the deck pre the tournament so he was able to figure, figure it out pretty quickly and in general as we mentioned when talking about greninja zorak variants are some of Greninja's best matchups so you're going to want to be uh, hopefully dodging the ninjas if you can you don't have space for things like Tina promos which are going to be your one of uh, which are only going to be helpful in your one of matchups you want to be finding space for things like handiwork which is our tech of choice uh, which can sort of out um out mill your other Zoroark decks and your other Zoroark control decks this is a really really weird deck to sort of build around build and build around because Every Zoro Lock list that tries to tech for the mirror, the next Zoro, Le Zoro Lock deck has to tech a bit more for the mirror. So there's the more the more techs you get, the less from the original list you get, which may end up meaning that a very very standard list could be the way to go. However, I think the more successful lists will be the techie lists um, that have weird and weird and wonderful things within them. One card of note, of course, is Mag Cargo, which seems to be another big winner from Celestial Storm. Uh, some people are saying you need. You do need to play it. Some people would prefer the two spots that the Slugma Mag Cargo do take up. But in general, um, I think you could see variants of both uh, Zoro Lock with and without Mag Cargo. There's there's a lot of different ways this deck can be built, and I don't think you're going to be able to sit down against a Zoro Lock player and know exactly the 60 they're playing, because there's so much creativity in this deck. Um, it's almost certain to make a splash and I think be very successful going into the tournament. Yeah, I think, again, this will be a highly played deck. And I think Jack's right, there's going to be banana skins in different people's lists at different times, so you've got to be trying to play it around. Delinquent, Enhanced Hammer, Flare Grunt, uh, Handiwork, uh, Parallel, all, all sorts of things you're playing around just because it's options galore for Zoro Lock, and they can just draw into the card that gets you on the certain turn. Like, you can't play around all of these things all at once, and that's what Zoro Lock preys on. It just hopes to be able to get the right turn to then be allowed into that game and then it can start really get, getting a stranglehold because its hand size gets so big um 
and it just draws into more and more options. It can use its puzzles aggressively so that you can, well, because you have the luxury of a Rangaru later on to recover them, so you can be really greedy. Unlike Zor other Zoro decks, which sort of need to use puzzles to get back more DCEs, Zoroloc can be very, very greedy with those puzzles uh, to have really punishing turns and then just at a later date, a Rangaru back in those puzzles. So um, definitely a fun deck to play definitely strong as well i think um really really dangerous deck i think the biggest banana skins for me is the fact that people are putting in field blowers to buzz rock we're encouraging it and i think this deck does have the weak underbelly against buzzwell decks and that's something that could be preyed on at worlds yeah definitely however if you didn't see your favorite deck maybe if there's another zoro deck for you uh, <laughs> we will talk about a couple of other decks as well obviously glaceon is a really really strong deck right now with all the zoro floating around uh, naturally having turn one ability lock on Lele's and then turn two onwards from Zoroark is always going to be good. You have a few other awkward matchups, but if you just expect to play nine rounds of Zoroark, there is nothing wrong with Glaceon right now. Yeah, and Ray as well, because uh, that's also a pretty good ability for Ray. Yes. Um, Buzzgarb is one that's always sort of been teetering on the edges. It's had some standout performances, but never really picked up by the masses. I think... Um, again, it's consistency is something that you need to uh, take into account. I feel like playing an order pad list is going to be already sketchy for any like nine round tournament. But I think it's the Rainbow Trash here, which is the real key note to take away because Rainbow Trash is really good, again, for Rayquaza, again, for some things like Zoroloc because they play so many item cards that can really punish them later on. And the fact that you're putting on Buzzwell pressure means they need to start motoring as quickly as possible. So. I think um, the Rainbow Trash builds that we've seen previously are really tempting in my eyes. Definitely. And finally, just before we talk about Zoro variants, there is this new Xerneas Electro deck. We had to talk about it. It's pretty much what uh, our UK team has always been known for. Xerneas, Tamao, Luke, and Joe, Alex. Every, pretty much everyone in our team has played Xerneas, at least at some point. Um, and it seems that Azul has repopularized this deck with an extra energy bomb electrode um so maybe it does have some pretty good matchups zoro does seem to be winnable ray is fantastic so if you just think people are going to respect those two decks it may be time to bring the pink boys back um it you would, we've just got to wait and see whether it actually comes to fruition obviously there is a big big downside giving your opponent two prizes with the electrode uh but you trade up to, into so many things when you attach like three dce and a counter or something crazy like that that's 200 damage for uh, live stream which is just crazy so you know there's definitely something to this deck i think and we'll have to wait and see whether it is uh, indeed the, the the one last ride for xerneas as well as greninja uh, that we've all wanted really oh he's tempted me already but let's start talking about some of these zoro decks i'll take on zoro guardi i think that's probably of these six the one i would lean towards the most having Gallade is going to be very nice for trying to take on the zoro arc mirror matches gardevoir again a good card for rayquaza reasonable for things like buzz rock and stuff like that and very good for zoro garb as well because you can uh, reset your item count quite easily so i think zoro Gardi, obviously you're reliant on hitting those rare candies and that's the biggest downfall for it right now but i think it's got some very good answers once you get set up it's just trying to fit the build to not be weak to all these things um like all the new control tools and stuff uh, whilst having still that solid core that you can get set up consistently that you're going to have to try and balance. Uh, but I think it's got big potential. Definitely. Another strong pick, I think, is Zoro Weavile. Um, we, we've seen in metas that are full of Zoro arcs, Zoro Weavile has done well. Ray is another fantastic matchup for you. Um, and just, you're going to be preying on Zoro arcs because of Weavile. Again, pretty much all we've been saying all video is there are a lot of decks that don't like being traded up against with one prize attackers and that's exactly what weavile does uh, you have some cute tricks with things like unit energies and uh rainbow energies that kind of thing there's a lot of cool splashable text you can throw into the deck in general uh it does have some big big issues with buzz rock though the whole deck pretty much is weak to fighting uh and your answer is often a mew and a mewtwo and no longer are they the answer you want because lycan rock seems to be uh one of the biggest attackers as well as baby buzzers still just doing so much damage to you so it does have a pretty awkward buzz rock uh, but if you're just going to respect people playing zoroark all day uh, maybe maybe you can just hit zoroarks deal some damage with weavile 
uh, and we can start preying on some of these really strong abilities right now. I'll take uh, Zora Burnett. I think that's a cool one. A shady move, a great ability. Pretty nice against the Buzzwell decks. Um, obviously, it's somewhat of a liability against Zoroark, but it's not the most terrible because it can finish off a game for you uh, by shady moving and knocking out a Tapu Lele. So it's not completely unusable. It feels kind of similar to like Zoro Pod, where you might have just less answers than um, the Zoro Lock decks, and that's the main thing that makes me not want to play it. But I think the Shady Move does get a lot of value, and it can create some really cool plays. So if anyone's made a good Zoro Burnett list, I wouldn't be surprised to see it do quite well. Yeah. Next up, we have Zoro Shiftery. This is one that I think a lot of people initially uh, paired together. Uh, Shiftry's attack does 180, 210 with a choice band if you have the same hand size, and Zoro is one of the best decks for matching hand size, along with cards like Judge and Copycat. You're also a 240 HP Pokemon, which is massive. It's really, really difficult to deal with right now. However, uh, with this grass variant, you are a stage 2, and it's a 2 energy attacker rather than a 1 energy attacker that is uh, that we find in Gillisopod. Uh, there are things like Mars Royale that you can play, but in general, I think you have a less consistent Zoro Pod deck if you're playing it. However, if you get set up, you do have a really, really powerful uh, Pokemon in your arsenal. It's so, so strong doing 210 uh, on a 240 HP Pokemon. You're going to be knocking out a lot of Pokemon and not getting knocked out in return. Um, the weakness is pretty much irrelevant right now. So again, you're going to be having one tanky Shiftry that probably has the potential to take four prizes for you uh, through the use of Guzma. And if you're playing Zoroark, you're going to have Guzmas when you want them because you're just going to be trading here, there and everywhere. So in general, it could be a really, really nice partner. It feels like the less consistent Zoropod with a really, really strong outcome if you do manage to piece all the puzzle together. But in general, you've got to remember this is a stage two at the end of the day. So it may not be the kind of deck you want to be playing for the World Championships. Another cool shout could be the Zoro Lucario deck. Um, basically, Zoro Rock struggles when people start playing the Zoro Lock build and just play crushing hammers and never allow you to get that lightning rock attacking well lucario is never going to struggle with that or a strike boom one attachment dead onto the next one again like we said with the um zoro rock you can still play the baby buzzworld as well for even more tempo swings if they're just going to try and grinch down your riolus i think the biggest downside to this is that it is fairly weak to Paradox city and that's pretty everywhere so <laughs> you got to play like at least two copies of your own parallel to try and make it stick for them, uh, at least make it difficult for them. But I think just because there's so much hammers around sort of does incentivize playing Lucario so that you can just do one attachment dead uh, because that feels pretty appealing. And the fact that you can do one attachment dead to like Rayquaza and all other sort of more greedy lists, more other like standing toe-to-toe -to, -toe to other one Nikyo decks is another appealing factor for this one. Yeah, definitely. And finally, Zoro Counters is has always been an, another deck that's kind of been uh, flirted with. In general, one of the biggest gains is Mad Cargo. There was a lot of different puzzle pieces, a lot of one prize, uh, one of attackers in the deck that you had to find on specific turns for specific matchups. And with Mad Cargo, you really, really increase your likelihood of doing that. You don't have to end up playing Mallow after Mallow just to find your uh, combo pieces. You can combo th with things like N. Guzma, that kind of thing as well now. So in general, my cargo is a really, really big boost for this style of deck. Um, it's always had some kind of inherent inconsistencies. However, and in general, as I've mentioned during the video, there's so much special energy hate right now. Uh, it could be a bit of a risk going into the tournament with just four DCs and probably three or four counters. Maybe you need to find a way of adding in some basic energy as well. Obviously, this kind of box deck, there are often box decks in the format that try and just throw in an answer. Uh, for every different matchup. And with Zor Zorak and Magkaga, like I say, you're going to be finding them as and when you want them. But in general, I think there are slightly more consistent lists, even with the Magkaga engine. Um, but that's not to say that, like, this is the kind of time with this kind of consistency where you're going to see some crazy uh, one prize attackers, probably, that can be powered up by counter energy to try and swing some of these more awkward matchups here, there, and everywhere. So I, I wouldn't be. Um, surprised to see someone trying out some counter energy stuff uh, just because there's so the pool of cards uh, is so large right now and it, there's a, this format is really really built to have some some kind of one prize attacker deck I think but yeah I think that's I think we've pretty much covered everything 
Uh, Mr. Mime's here to say good luck in Nashville, everyone. Joe will be going. I'm not attending, unfortunately. This is the last year I'm not attending, though. You can mark my words. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will promise you that. But it's still been good uh, sort of seeing everyone scrambling their ideas together. This, this, to me, has been the world's, at least sitting from the outside, that no one has had any idea for the most in a long time there's with like the uk has always kind of played some clownery stuff but in general there's been a pretty good consensus of what's been good guardy was tipped to be the best deck last year and won so you know um there's i think the meta wasn't figured out last year but there was a very very strong tier one deck uh, whereas i think we could see honestly probably any of the top 10 decks we've spoken about today do really well and maybe even take the down this tournament yeah, I agree. It's an absolute headache if you're going. Um, <laughs> I'm really struggling with what deck to play. Um, I think if I was to play a Zorark deck, it would probably be Zoro Lock. If I was going to play any other deck, I'm thinking Buzzwall of some capacity. I don't know if it's playing just baby buzzes and no Lycanroc, or if it's playing a Mag Cargo build. I'm liking the fighting stuff just because of the amount of Zorowak being played, basically, but... I'm still scratching my head at the lack of consistency that it somehow always manages to have. <laughs> so I think those are my like two current standpoints on the meta. But as you said, people can just break stuff. Like Shrine is a card that can just surprise people and be broken in something. Ray could be way better than expected if people A, play it right and B, build it correctly. Because I'm not sure if either of those things are being done perfectly just yet. So um, there's a lot of factors going into this world, which makes it a very difficult tournament. Not the less... Not the least the fact that there's going to be probably nine rounds as well for day one. So it's going to be very tricky no matter what. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but other than that, I think we've pretty much covered everything. There's still some deck analysis videos going up on the channel. Uh, me and Joe are away for the weeks leading up to Worlds, but we're going to have plenty of content for you guys uh, leading up to Worlds. And then we'll hopefully be back into regular streaming just after Worlds to discuss exactly what's happened and how uh, our own Joe Bernard has been been, been taken down by Todd Reckled in the final um, but yeah other than that thank you very much for watching I think this has been a pretty long video as always with the uh, with our top 10 decks but we had to get our ideas out there somewhere uh, so if there's any other thoughts from you Jay I'm good I'll see you at Wells guys